with you another week of talking about the Atomic Keto, which is taking the James Clear book, Atomic Habits, and really incorporating how do we change these behaviors, not for playtime, but here at the Dr. Boz channel, we take it to a real level, hopefully sharing some authentic, even if embarrassing, uh, stories from me and my journey. Uh, in the past, we've been looking at how we take our our plate, which is a way to write down some habits on note cards, looking at for where looking at where you sabotage uh, your behaviors. Uh, thanks for the reinforcement of the sound, everybody. Thank you. Um, this week we are taking our habits to a a hormonal, and might I say primal hormonal level and talking about what makes things desirable. How can we manipulate that desire and find attraction in the behaviors that we do to keep those behaviors consistent? But first, we have some traditions here on the show uh, that I am thankful uh, you guys keep showing up because I can keep doing these traditions. And one of them is I check my numbers. I have been pretty good about my fast. It was Easter on Sunday and we had kiddos home from college and girlfriends, we had visitors from, um, from neighbors and far and that meant there was some food around that typically I would have been, I would have been all over saying I need my fair share, I deserve my fair share, but I did really good, I did really good. William Brown, nice to see you from South Dakota, checking in there. Uh, yes, uh, Mr. Brown, the one of the best uh, cooks, I, I would say, or chefs, can I call it chef in, in Pierre, South Dakota? Although you'd have to go to his home to know that because he doesn't have a commercial kitchen. He just has a brilliant <laughs> uh, touch for cooking. Oh, I don't know if I have enough blood. Okay, some ketones here. Again, I gotta have to poke that again because it was not quite enough. Ketones should be pretty good. I don't know. Um, yeah, they are yeah, not terrible. 1.2. Uh, again, I, I didn't start fasting early on Sunday. It was pretty late on Sunday, so I am probably barely at 48 hours by now. And my sugar is, uh, let's see, 86. Uh, so if you want to help me out with some of those Dr. Boz ratios. Oh, I see some folks from Austin, Texas. Somebody checked in from Allen, Texas the other day, and I've stayed on your main street a couple times. I have a really good friend couple friend that lives uh, in McKinney, Texas, yeah, or close to McKinney, Texas. Anyway, um, I am also going to click over to this because there's a couple things that I've been talking about on the show. Um, not only do I try to fast every week, but I do try to find ways that you can help yourself the best way possible. Actually, I have the wrong promo code there. Don't write that down. Write down this one. Mm. That is, uh, if you take, uh, can I find, can somebody on my team put a the link in the chat for that, um, that uh, promotion code that is, let me see here, uh, if I could do it, maybe I could do it too. Ha, huh. so there is the link actually that should get you to this kit. Um, again, there were only 120, and I must not be doing a very good job of telling you how good of a deal this is. Uh, so you get the kit that I use every day, uh, every week on my ketones and glucose, and you can buy the strips um, at, you know, at different things, but the meter is practically free. And the reason this is 50% off with that uh, promo code is because uh, the strips will stop working on, on this kit in August. So you have about four or five months to use them. Guaranteed you will go through the 10 strips in this kit for uric acid if you're trying to do what I do, which is you should be decreasing your uric acid, get it down to 4.5. That is where healthy people live. And it's not, um, it's not an easy task. Um, I have a couple of great stories from the support group that I lead here in Tampa. And one of the things I push them to do is check your uric acid. Take a look at how well you have done at your autophagy, which is um, staying consistently keto long enough that you've really started to turn over some of those um, unused proteins. And I think of uric acid as a way to measure the debris in your body. And when you're doing a good job of churning metabolism in the right direction, you really can lower that uric acid. We have a gal who was um, had lost the weight, had plenty of uh, healthcare background, 
But when she checked into the support group at the beginning, which is about five or six months now, uh, her uric acid was over 11, which is really high. Uh, lots of other things have been great, but she kept coming to group each week, week after week. And she lost another 20 pounds, which she didn't think she had to lose. But her uh, uric acid came back in in the five range in the last couple of weeks. And again, we had her looking at her uric acid every week and then following those steps in the keto continuum. So I know there were only a, like 120 of these kits available, and I think there's a, a dozen or so left. So if you click on there, even if for a Christmas gift, it's 50% off, you get the kits, you get everything in that picture, but you should take the uric acid strips for yourself. Give the kit to somebody else if you already have one, but the uric acid strips are a really good barometer to say, how healthy are you? And I contend by looking at your uric acid and your hemoglobin A1C, those are two of the best metrics to say, just how good at keto are you? I like looking at my numbers daily or at least several times a week. I try to check them here on the show with you. And then um, my, my goal is to actually drink ketones throughout the show in order for you to see that when you're paying for ketones, they should raise your numbers. So hopefully by the end of the show, <laughs> I will uh, have a higher ketone number. We'll check it at the end. For those of you following along week after week, I did a rotten job last week of getting to the questions. I talked way too long about what I was trying to teach and I'm gonna do a better job this week. So post your questions in here. I am gonna shoot clean up on a couple of the questions from last week because they were such good questions. So please post your questions. We have a team putting them in a document so I can review your questions at the end. Um, and <clears throat> And I'm just drinking a few of those ketones with a little bit of water there. Um, all right, a couple other announcements. These are other places where folks want to know where they can find me. And I'm going to turn that off and then turn on this. And um, there is the Keto Summit. This is August 4th through the 7th. That says here in my now home state of Florida. My home state used to be South Dakota, so that's really hard for me to, to say out loud, but truly. Um, and these folks at the Keto Summit, last week I did a, a call with some of the leadership and it really is a great connection for me because they are all about developing that community of keto people. So if you're looking for real live human connections where you can look folks in the eyeball, I have a great lecture I'm preparing for that one and uh, I'm really looking forward to engaging with this audience because I think they are a, a really strong match for what I'm trying to do on the ketogenic journey. Um, next, we do have KetoCon, and this uh, one, this is going to be one of the more difficult lectures I give. I am I'm working on it, and it's technically difficult to concentrate this into a short period of time, but man, I am working hard at getting uh, a why immune systems, especially that autoimmune problems, reverse when on a ketogenic diet, and I, I will not be doing that on YouTube. It will be in person, so July 8th through the 10th in Austin, Texas. Uh, we are working on our booth there and I'm really trying to do something fun at our booth that you should care about. <laughs> so hopefully if nothing else you can check out our booth and find out what we're doing at our booth when we're in Austin. My team is trying really hard to uh, get that all organized with all that we have on our plate so I again hats off to them. Um, last but not least and this promotion code is not Dr. Boz it is uh, the word Bosworth. And again, here's what I really do ask about this one. This is my conference. This is what I will go to to get continuing medical education. Uh, it is super sciencey. Like I've invited a couple people and they were like almost mad because <laughs> I sat in the front row. This is what I, I felt like I was in college again, but I loved it. It felt so nourishing to me to be fed by the people that can help me advance my education in the ketogenic journey. Um, and this conference didn't get to happen last year. I'm so excited to go. I'm taking the two interns with me uh, who've been helping me out around the clinic. Uh, and they are going to come to this <laughs> metabolic club. They have no idea how sciencey it is. They just know it's in California and um, one has not been there. So I'm so excited to show them. But uh, this promotion code is for $100. Uh, that is what the, is what the um, virtual admission is for. 
And even if you only watch a couple of the videos, it is a great place to give your money to them. I don't get any kickback. If you put in the promo code, you get a little discount, and then they know I sent you. And the real reason I push people to do this is to kind of virtue signal to these leaders that I really support their workshop. I, you know, I've paid for all of my tickets full price and gave them all the money without reservation at all because I really want them to succeed. Uh, this is the kind of conference where I need this in order to keep my license, not just for the education, but when I need evidence to say I am doing evidence-based medicine, these are the people that help me. Uh, so I appreciate anybody who can, um, who can uh, put uh, some support in that direction. Let's see, what else is there an announcement for? Did I get them all? I'm going on the keto cruise here in a few weeks, but that's kind of full and hard to get into. So I don't think there's any other um, announcements on that section. I am going to, uh, oh yes, let's do this. Cause this is a big moment. Check this out, you guys, look what you did. Uh, so my first book, again, the one that I nearly, um, well, I would never say divorce, but my husband prompted me to write this book and I did not want to write a book um, and he wins. I wrote a book and then I self-published it because I'm like, look, husband, I'm done. <laughs> And uh, I kept hearing from all of this stuff on Amazon that if you got to 3,000 reviews, I don't know, something magical was supposed to happen. But look what happened today. <laughs> look what happened today. You guys have written enough reviews that we hit 3,000. This is such a big moment for me. So I am, I am so thankful. I'm gonna scroll down and show you what the 3,000th review said because it was nice and lovely and kind of made me feel good. <laughs> all right, so here it is. Um, so yes, Meg writes in and says, Grandma Rose won. Um, and it was reviewed on the 16th, so even before today. Um, Dr. Buzz wrote this book out of the love for her mother and her journey with cancer. Grandma Rose listened to her daughter and changed her diet and won. I've been kind of doing keto for years. I did not understand the link between ketones and insulin resistance. First, I read uh, the book, I read Dr. Buzz's second book, which is the one behind me on the shelf, Keto Continuum. Then I listened to this book because I wanted to hear Grandma Rose's journey. Still learning from Dr. Boz, thank you. Uh, let me just do two more. They're really short, but they're really good. <laughs> um, again, I read all of these reviews. It is such a big deal for an independent author to have somebody to have reviews. So thank you, thank you, thank you for writing them. Uh, I have followed some form of Atkins low carb keto carnivore diet for over 22 years. That's impressive. That's way ahead of your time, girl. Um, fads and information have come and gone. And I think I've read about all of them. I learned more in this one book than I've learned in, in the last 22 years about what is actually going on in my body when I produce ketones. <laughs> that's, that's a huge compliment, so thank you, thank you. And the last one, again, Enlightening and Educational by Margaret. This book is fascinating and eye-opening with information that was completely new to me. And I've been a medical person for many years. It excited me to try the ketogenic lifestyle and I have never looked back. Dr. Boss shares details of her mother's cancer battle as well as examples from her medical practice. She highlights the incredible results from low carb, uh, way of eating. I highly recommend the book if you are curious what this way of eating can do for you. So again, thank you, thank you for doing that. Um, I, uh, I, I, it's about the only praise I can say for Amazon. Um, I was going to, let's go back a page, see if I can do that. So I went to my own uh, store on Amazon and I just wanna say for those of you that are waiting uh, patiently for me to figure out how to get back on Amazon, um, if you go to K2D3 and then you click on that, see that visit Dr. Boz store right there? That's highlighted when I roll over it. Um, if I go there, um, <laughs> it takes you to the store, which you can see is a sad sight because like I've worked since January 1st to try and get all these products back up and running, but practically on Amazon, the only thing I've got figured out is K2D3, um, the books, and I think the test kit, but I don't think that's on this page. I have to change the page. Anyway, I'm just showing you that that's a nightmare. Um, and uh, if you want to find the products, you can go to bozmd.com, which is great, but is also um, not Amazon. Um, we do pay for your shipping here in the United States. Um, but for the other, um, other options out there, I have, I have, uh, f made it, I don't know if that's a good word yet or not, to Walmart. <laughs> uh, the Walmart store is available and 
I was hoping to show you the videos that we made about the products. I've had lots of people ask me videos about the videos for products. And I don't want to put them up on YouTube because they're just, it's me telling about these products. I don't think I'll put them up on YouTube. I don't know. Anyway, but I'm putting them up on my website and I'm putting them up in Amazon and on Walmart. But I'm not going to, don't hold your breath for Amazon. We've been holding our breath since January 1st and we're still dead <laughs> trying to prove to them what we say versus what they say. Anyway, um, so watch for those videos. Hopefully they'll be up next week and I'll show you how to click on them. Um, all right, so we are going to hop over to what I think is the best part of some of this book for the um, Keto Continuum. Not Keto Continuum, the Atomic Keto. Now, Atomic Habits, again, is what James Clear did a couple years ago when he wrote this book, is he took like the giants of behavior change and he put them in a sequence, in an order that really does help, um, help me be a better teacher by kind of saying, how is it that I could help people change behavior? Uh, and notwithstanding that <laughs> I'm in that behavior change as well, that um, I know that when we get to true long-term thinking, we need folks to say less about what their goal thinking is and more about really who, what their identity is, about a cycle of refining and changing habits, uh, a continuous improvement. And if you're going to stay the course, habits, especially, I turned 50 this year, uh, you don't change a brain that's as hardwired <laughs> as mine uh, by adopting a habit for a few weeks. You really have to change a habit, find a, a process that really motivates that change in a way that's sustainable. Uh, and again, that's very consistent with what I teach, not just in the clinic, but also on the online courses to say, you really um, can do this but you cannot do it in a way that maybe I was taught by my parents or some of the other processes of changing behavior that uh, they are a flash in the pan for what really is consistent change. Um, I, I also had somebody write in the other day saying, tell me about the new room you're in. So I'm gonna point out this, this thingy. <laughs> um, there was, for some of you, you may or may not know that I, I moved to Tampa and my husband was in charge of finding the, I'm gonna change this to, um, my husband was in charge of finding the, um, the office space. Office. Things that looks like a stripper pole <laughs> is actually from the people who used to rent this office. And that is um, the TB12 or, uh, it's Tom Brady 12. Uh, yeah, my husband found the rental place. Uh, he is obsessed with Tom Brady, I swear. Uh, but the TB12 team, the one thing that I had to sign on the lease before I could take over the space is you cannot take that pole off of the wall. It's drilled into some stud that is uh, very important not to touch it. So I've had to design around it and I'm failing. So check in over the next couple of weeks. We're trying to make that look like not such an eyesore. Um, but people wanted to know what it was, and I said, I'll tell you on the next show. So there you go. I am also going to go to here um, and take that away and go to Keynote. There we go. All right, so again, um, the plate, what I talked about when I introduced this this morning, uh, when we first started was, uh, this is an acronym that I use for, with patients. I send them home with three by five cards and fill out, I want them, when they've screwed it up, to analyze themselves. And I use this PLATE acronym to say, tell me what, what persons you were around, what location you were at, what activity you were doing, the timing, like the time of day, and what emotions you were fighting when you screwed it up. Uh, you know, that we call this a post-mortem when you're in medicine, that you um, understand what went wrong after things went wrong. And if you, it is one of the highest teaching moments but it's difficult for people to uh, push, <laughs> push uh, against um, change and then really look um, inside the, the pathology of their own behaviors. But these note cards, when you get, I tell people don't quit till you got six of them. Six of these cards is minimum. I love it when they have like a dozen or two dozen because you can really see the pattern of what your behavior is um, when you're looking at things that went wrong. Uh, the second thing we really focused on, or the second major section of this book, was um, 
stopping to say that I want to lose weight and beginning with um, a true shift of that identity. Uh, the classic example of that is they don't want to exercise, they want to become a runner or they want to be, they want to be healthier. And that it can't just be this glib um, bumper sticker. It really needs to be that ingrained identity. So when you look at what most people do, they start with the outcome they want, saying, I want to lose weight. Uh, I want to exercise more. Uh, and, they, and they don't really bring the, pro I mean, exercise is the process. Outcomes are what they, weight loss was the outcome. It's that identity that they really need to shift. And that is what is sustainable over time. Um, when you look at uh, switching that around and starting with identity uh, and then finding a process, uh, the outcomes will come. Uh, it is a true shift of what, where the focus needs to be for people who are truly successful on uh, changing their identity and changing a habit that isn't for a few weeks but really is consistently changed. Um, mm -hmm. So um, the, uh, the anyway, or not anyway, I need to change these words. Hold on, let me fix that. Take that away and then put in atomic keto. Ha, see, look at that. All right, so then when looking at atomic keto, uh, they, there really are some, it's a pretty nice platform that, that he has set up in this book. And we look at what things cue you. That's what those cards were meant to look at is when you screwed it up, there was a cue. There was something that triggered you. And then you had a craving and you did a response and it, it clearly is working for you because it's rewarding. And we can take that same behavior and change it from um, a pathologic or what I, I don't like to call them bad habits, but habits that are not making you healthier and switch them to habits that really are improving, who you, improving the outcome. Um, you know, the problem focus of, um, you know, where many people hang out um, is, is not as, um, is not as um, uh, lovely to talk about. It's actually more conf confronting or conflictual. Um, when we look at our responses and rewards, it, it, it's a little easier conversations to have. But I'll tell you, if they don't have that postmortem, if they don't write down, when am I doing this and why am I doing this? I've sent people to therapy for, I mean, they'd gone to therapy for six years. I hadn't made one sustainable change until I made them do this activity and said, you cannot come to the next appointment without at least six of these cards filled out. I need you studying yourself. And if I care more about it than you, this relationship is not going to work. I need you showing up back at your appointment with these cards filled out about what happens when things go wrong. And I need you to write it down shortly thereafter you mess it up. And by golly, we changed behavior so quickly when they were able to identify that. Tonight, we are getting to one of my favorite uh, uh, parts of a habit, and that is um, when, uh, when we really try to make it hormonal. I'm not going to do that just yet. I'm going to go back to here. Um, hold on a second. So this morning at my uh, support group, I had a couple of uh, conversations. I usually try to talk, open up with the support group. Actually, I'm really hot in here, so I'm going to turn this, take this off. Uh, I usually open up with a support group. Ah, I'm going to use it as a hanger now. Um, open up the support group with um, a, um, a lead-in about what I'm going to talk about that tonight at the, at the sh live show. And um, 20 years in, plus years in helping people change away from addiction, uh, you learn that <laughs> dopamine is primal. Sex, drugs, rock and roll, the cravings we have in life, they are wired by lots of neurotransmitters, lots of chemistry in your brain. But dopamine gets the big neon light. It gets the headliner. It is a very nice driving force for what we do. There's actually a study that, um, that James Clear puts in his book about when they took rats and they removed their ability to to make dopamine. They, their brains had that part removed. Uh, the rats no longer wanted for sugar because they were one of the one of the, the rats were looking for the sugar that they were eating. Um, but they also uh, did not want sex and they did not want thirst. Uh, I think it's very interesting when they were studying the rats they they were still able to see that the rats got pleasure 
uh, they, they felt joy from sugar, from what they had been trained, like the dopamine response. It, but because they couldn't produce dopamine, they had no desire to eat. They had no desire to want for this primal process within the human, within the mammalian uh, species that they died. So dopamine, you know, when I when you're in the world of addiction, <laughs> uh, people are like, uh, dopamine is this bad thing that drives people to do behaviors that they, you know, lose control over. I'm like, well, don't qu demonize it quite that badly. Uh, dopamine is how your brain is wired to have pleasure, and without that wiring, we don't exist. We don't we don't drink. We don't eat. We don't have sex. We don't have primal responses to our to our environment. Um, but I do talk about how when you are programming a brain, and parents, I talk about, I, I encourage you to, to look at some of the behaviors you're rewarding in those teenage years. That brain is wiring so stinking hard. Um, you know, I, I have teenagers, I, am, I counsel teenagers, and I am the first one to say that, yes, I know that several of your friends are going to drink alcohol. Yes, I know that marijuana has somehow turned into this safe thing that you can do. But I'm here to tell you, you do not want your brain wired for that. Uh, you know, the same thing goes with pornography. By looking at, you know, sexual um, uh, you know, depictions and, and charging up that sensation of joy, of pleasure uh, from one path, especially over programming it, uh, leads to serious pathology in the brain. You know, the workshop I have coming up in Pella is, again, it's 12 hours long. <laughs> it is free if you show up in Pella. They are sponsoring it for free. Uh, that is June, uh, Thursday and Friday, second and third. And I do a really good job of teaching, yes, your brain wants dopamine. Um, and if you wire the brain for a well-rounded brain, a brain that is healthy, you can get pleasure from many different areas. Addiction shows up when we take one pathway that is leading to that dopamine production and we do it again and again and again and again. And instead of using it, we are abusing it. The only way they can feel joy is through that one neural pathway. Uh, the brain should have a half dozen ways that it makes dopamine production. But if the only neural pathway that gets practiced, or the majority of one that gets practiced, is uh, from one of those pathways, that is how addiction gets wired. I, I often get the question, especially for alcohol, can't I, will I ever be able to drink alcohol again and not have a problem? And the answer is rooted in, their, in those neural pathways. Um, I, I'll, I'll, I'll exploit some of my addiction. So as a child, I uh, had a major move. <laughs> this is so pathetic because my husband thinks this is definitely, um, okay, it was, it was a move. For me, it was a move. <laughs> I grew up on a farm. Uh, my dad is an identical twin and I li we lived in a twin home with the other twins family, which was on the same place as my grandparents. And at the age of 10, we moved out of that house up the road like six miles so really nothing in my life changed but my husband makes fun he moved 14 times before he was 15 or something like that so he had lots of trauma moving all over the place and his army brat uh, um, but I moved up the street but at that after that 10 year old um, move I specifically remember that the swans man which was the ice cream truck had a new route and our farmhouse was on it and my parents God bless them. They <laughs> they rewarded their their days their hard days work with ice cream, and it was from the Swan's truck. And the specific ice cream that my mother loved was cherry nut. <laughs> my sister hated it. I, I I thought it was sweet and I loved it. But every night when we would get together as a family, my parents would scoop up some of that cherry nut. We would sit around the table, and um, we would eat the cherry nut, and we would play cribbage. We would play cards. Um, and like most card games, the first couple of hands of cribbage, you just kind of get through them. And then there's something that happens at that third or fourth uh, round of cards that was rewarding. That was the relationship. Those are the things I can remember where we had discussions that you're never going to have if you sit still for only a bowl of ice cream. You got to sit still and have a couple of 
rounds of cards to get to the part where you're going to either debate over something or disagree um, on something. And I look at that time of family, of relationship development, of a very rewarding for me uh, as a child, as a, you know, very formative years in my, my upbringing, that it was linked to ice cream. <laughs> That's where I'm getting here. And uh, as I launch out of the nest and go off and do my life, every time life got hard and I was struggling and I needed to escape, sure, a glass of wine might have been something, but it was never where I got the best pleasure. I got pleasure from ice cream. <laughs> I got it again and again and again and again, and it was very much linked to that sense of comfort that was wired in my brain from the age of 10 years old um, through at least 18 when I left home, uh, and I practiced it very routinely thanks to mom and dad. You look at that uh, rewiring where I say, okay, I can't get pleasure from that for the rest of my life or I am going to have health problems. Um, I also teach health. I know exactly what I'm doing and that's not a good thing. So as my number nine wire in my brain for rewarding, for comforting, for producing dopamine, um, you could definitely say it was a primal <laughs> relationship with ice cream that I really wanted. I, when I get sad or disappointed or grieving, ice cream comes to mind right away. It's very rewarding. And uh, if you could kind of open up and dissect my brain, I have other ways that I get pleasure. I like to exercise. I love being in a community. I am very rooted in relationships. Um, and ice cream was on the list too. So as you look at some of the primal changes that um, uh, happen when you're wiring a brain, before the age of 26, you're gonna know which areas of life you get your rewards from. And um, if you've over-practiced one, let's say alcoholism, especially alcoholism that really takes its roots before the age of 26. And then they come see me at the age of 30 because they've lost a job, but they can't keep the relationship together. The alcohol has really taken over their life. And indeed, the thoughts and use of alcohol used to give them these bursts of dopamine in their brain, these pleasures that are so primal. Uh, and now it doesn't do that anymore. Um, they need to take more and more alcohol to get that reward. And they want to know if we get them off of alcohol and we clean up their brain and we put them on the, um, the you know, path for recovery, some of the brain uh, protocols I use, will they ever be able to drink alcohol and just have a social relationship to it? And I'm quick to tell them that it does depend on how rooted that behavior is in producing dopamine and how well we can resurrect those other neural pathways uh, to reward them with, with dopamine. So for instance, um, as I was trying to address my uh, pathetic addiction to ice cream, but true, uh, I was trying to say, I need to stop doing this. Uh, I, ha I did use several of the things that James Clear puts in his book. Um, I'm gonna go back over to my, um, uh, my, oh, that's a seat. Let's go to, Give me just a second. Um, wait, wait, wait. There we go. Um, that when I look at um, uh, several of these uh, um, primal changes, this one, this uh, this chart I filled out when I was trying to say how will I stop. Um, uh, well, how will I find reward? Again, that getting to, to those second, that third and fourth laws, how do you really make something as attractive and rewarding? How do you pique that brain to want for uh, a behavior change that is not going to give you these bursts of dopamine like you have programmed it to do with a substance such as sugar, but also like alcohol? And the answer is that the behaviors need to have a reward in the beginning. So I look at some of the, um, if you look at that fourth law down in that lower corner, it says, okay, so um, sure, the cue for me to eat is, um, uh, well, keep the fridge empty because I look in it a lot. <laughs> um, the second thing is um, if I need something that isn't, if I want something that's not on the plate that I should be eating, well, make me go to the store and buy it. Don't put it in the fridge. Uh, make it unattractive for me to make that bad habit. Um, 
the next one is set a rule that on the way home from work, which is like an hour commute for me, that I eat the can of sardines on the way home from work. By golly, by the time I get home, I don't want the food. And the last one is something where I know when I get home from work, I want to relax. I want to not think about some of the things that are going on in my mind. And these were, these were places where I would find pleasure. And it's not anything close to the dopamine that was produced by ice cream at first. But by practicing these other neural pathways that I like spending time with my husband, I like taking a bath, especially if it's ready right when I get home. And my husband knows that. <laughs> uh, that I, there's a few shows that are completely mindless and they don't make me think at all, and, but they're entertaining. And I find pleasure in just sitting there and not thinking about anything. And finding that a link to eating at night, um, th th what makes it unattractive is that if I do eat late at night, then I don't get that time with my husband. Um, finding a way to make that rewarding behavior satisfying and that um, something I truly do enjoy, which is sitting on the couch watching a show with my husband. Um, but I, if I eat at night, we don't get to do that. And those are, those are just examples of one way to make um, uh, a primal behavior less attractive. And, and before I hop over to your questions, because I do want to get to those really quick here, I want to make sure I close this, um, this thought process that um, when you have a habit that's in your brain and you were wired that way, I mean, so many of us were wired to eat processed foods over the course of um, our lifetimes and have that um, distinct drive to want to eat when we're upset, that um, when you're upset, your brain will remember that. The alcoholic will always remember that alcohol produced dopamine, especially if you look at the, the different ways you can make dopamine and you have in just a spider's thread uh, on most of the dopamine threads. It, it's a very tiny thread, but you got this number nine wire that leads to how do I make dopamine from the habit that I abused? you can lessen the trigger of that number nine wire by studying the things that really are important. What are those things on your plate? Uh, how do you set up a process that gives you pleasure linked to the good habit? Um, I, was, I shared with a group this morning that um, my husband and I were in a, in a fight of a, 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 you know, we've been married enough years to know what fighting is all about. And when we fight, uh, one of our ways we get through it is we play cards. Um, cribbage is one of those cards games and we don't talk very much when we play cards we just spend time together knowing that we'll figure it out if we don't if we don't stop communicating and sometimes the only way we communicate is who wins the card game but that relationship of sitting still and playing cards and doing that again and again uh, it truly is a joy association in my mind I know it is rooted to that ice cream uh, um, seance, that ritual of ice cream that is from my childhood. Um, and it wasn't easy for me to find the pleasure in finding, in, in playing the card game. Uh, it was easy to find the pleasure in the ice cream. But practicing that pleasure part that is also linked to a good behavior. You know, sitting still with my, I, the point of the story that I was telling about my husband is um, we played 152 cribbage games without speaking. Um, and then, <laughs> and then we spoke, and uh, and we moved to Florida. <laughs> he won, <laughs> and I'm happy he won. Uh, but those are just uh, th that's a place where you say taking a habit uh, and finding a way through the other side is about linking. It, it wasn't easy for me to pull the joy out of a card game. Uh, you had to try for that. You had to find a way to design that there is pleasure in sitting still and getting through what could be a relationship-breaking process when, we, when you struggle to make a decision as a couple. Um, but in that place where you sat together, and in my heart, and my husband knew this, <laughs> I got joy out of sitting still and playing cards. And, well, he can be quiet a lot longer than me. <laughs> so 150 games I lost, I spoke first, ye who speaks first loses, and I lost, and we moved to Florida. And I'm okay with that, <laughs> but it took 152 card games. 
<laughs> anyway, all right. So let's get to your questions. I hope that made. I hope I pulled that circle all the way around, saying behavior change is not this default easy thing uh, that happens without trying, but linking behavior uh, in that sense of drawing a different way that dopamine can be made, and not defaulting to whatever your brain was wired with as a child. Uh, it does take a little bit um, of doing. Let's get to your questions. Uh, let's see, good questions right here. All right. Um, all right. So I have um, several of these. Let's see. Um, I think I did how much does stress affect your insulin last week, but I wanted to make a, a couple of these. Uh, oh, I did that one last week too. Um, oh, Wild Tiger, I saw this one. On a limited income, is it okay to use MCT without ketones in a can? Sure. The best way to get MCT to turn into ketones is to take that MCT on an empty stomach. And you might find that that's a little distressing to stomach, so be careful about, ooh, I should bring that down, so that, uh, might be, find that that's a little distressing to stomachs. Um, I will tell you that, I, I mean, gosh, if you've got a birthday coming up or anybody that can get you at one can of what ketones can do for a 70 year old that's not active. I mean, yes, your body needs to make those, that MCT into ketones. And I know healthy systems can make them into ketones, but I've seen some people with insulin resistant and they chugged that MCT. They were drinking plenty of MCT. They should have had really high ketones and they did not their body was so insulin resistant that they couldn't turn on the mechanics that were hidden inside their cellular parts. By exposing the cells to ketones, even for a two week period, the, key, the MCT will work better after that. Your ability to produce ketones is better after the cell has been exposed to ketones. And I, I wish I had known this as well at the beginning of my story. I think my mother would have had a quicker, she had a great story, but we could have got there a heck of a lot quicker had I known some of these little hacks about, you're not gonna be on ketones forever. You're gonna wake up the cellular parts and then if you, especially if you have the workbook, that one on the, oh, I didn't bring it back here. The Keto Continuum Workbook, which is cheap, it's like 15, 19 bucks. Uh, follow that, uh, that alone, can um, improve how well your um, how well your mechanics work inside your, your system. All right, let's keep going. I do want to get to a lot of these questions because I felt really guilty last week that I didn't get to too many. All right. Mm. What the heck? How could I drink all that? Um, okay. To detox, I eat more vegetables and protein, which comes uh, from beans. I really feel uh, even my mindset is better and my belt changed a lot. Plus I reduced salt and removed any artificial sucrose. Okay. All right, I don't know where the question is on that one. Guys, just put questions in here. <laughs> I have a thyroid medicine and would love to stop it. Mm. Will keto help with that? Okay, so um, there's two places that I'm careful to talk about, uh, about on keto. One is asthma and one is thyroid. And I'll answer your questions, but I really want you to take this in the context that you gotta talk to your doctor. Thyroid is easy to measure. I know people talk about thyroid and reverse thyroid and, and all the different ways you can measure thyroid, but the punchline is we are really good at measuring thyroid. Our, our lab tests for thyroid are awesome. Um, I've said many times on this show that I was shocked by lowering the thyroid doses for my patients on keto. It did not happen when they played keto, when they did, when they said, I'm keto, but they never really produced ketones, when they never got a Dr. Boz ratio under 100, uh, when they were keto for six weeks, you're not gonna fix the thyroid in six weeks. When they were consistently keto, which is why I'm spending this time doing atomic keto, is I really wanna show you some of these awesome tools to change a behavior forever. And it doesn't happen fast, and it rarely happens in isolation. A support group is really important. But thyroid was one of those that at six months, when pe people were coming to the group and they would, at six months, we would check their thyroid and I expected it to be the same. And it took, you know, that six month interval of checking it three or four times before I'm back at the literature saying, why the heck did their thyroid needs go down? And um, I now have learned that it is truly when the thyroid is related to an autoimmune disorder, 
it truly does change uh, how much of that um, antibody is being made to destroy that active thyroid hormone. And if your thyroid is healthy enough to resurrect the cells and do their job, I have seen people get off their thyroid and their thyroid numbers are normal. It does depend, why did your thyroid go south in the first place? Um, how long has it been there? And what is the true underlying health of your thyroid minus all the inflammation and autoimmune processes going on? That is not a simple answer, I get it, but it truly does change um, with many, a, a larger population than I was ever expecting. Um, the second place that I'm careful to answer questions for, I had a chance to do that this morning in our support group. So um, I'll tell you a little bit about the story. The man was coming to group. He's been coming since January. Again, group. if you're looking for a support group in Tampa, 4809 North Armenia, there's a pin chasers. That's a bowling alley here in Tampa. And you can come every Tuesday from 8 to 9. I'm there to answer questions and help anybody that wants it. This gentleman's been coming. His wife uh, has asthma, and she's been waking up at 3 in the morning and wants to know, is could keto help her? And the short answer is yes, it could help her. Asthma is rooted in an inflammatory process. There is often an autoimmune component to it. He went on to tell a further story that his, um, his um, wife's asthma started after the birth of a second child, which is a, a history point that is, it makes it much more likely that her asthma is rooted in an autoimmune process. Um, for that reason, I said, you should be very careful Asthma still kills way too many people. It should not kill anyone. Uh, and I mean that, it shouldn't kill anyone. It is completely preventable. And the medicines that we have to reverse inflammation, um, especially for the lungs, are incredible. Like if you have an autoimmune problem in your brain, which would be like multiple sclerosis or chronic migraines, I can't get my medicine to those cells and rub it into those cells to take away the inflammation. I have to find a way to get past your lymph system and past your liver and past the blood-brain barrier and into the place that I want it. Same problem for rheumatoid arthritis. Same problem for lupus and the blood vessels that go, go inflamed. But when you have asthma, you can breathe in the drug that I need to get to those cells and reverse some of that inflammation. So do not stop taking your asthma medication. It is very important. However, the underlying pathology of an autoimmune asthmatic shows a huge promise if they can not just dabble in keto, but become consistently keto and take their numbers to a place where I try to show you on my show every week, this isn't fake news for me. I really do try to deliver what I offer to people. I try to show you what I taught my mother. Um, and at 71, her, her world got awful when cancer was taking over her life. And yeah, the story is worth 3,000 reviews. Thank you again for everyone who did that. Keep sending reviews. I don't know that 3,000 is the magical number. That's what some guru told me that <laughs> when I first put my book up. Um, okay, Eileen says, I bought an aura ring to get, uh, uh, get data on deep sleep and I have three nights so far. Um, deep sleep is 10%, REM is 37. I would tell you to get about at least a month worth of data before you start to judge it. Uh, are these numbers good? Set right back in when you've had a few months worth. Um, and actually, um, if you look, Patrick V, one of my favorite people, he has an aura ring and he's probably my aura ring expert. So I'm gonna let him answer what he would say. Does he think the, the deep sleep 10% and the REM 30% from the aura ring are good numbers? Um, I, I would be curious to see what, what what Patrick's uh, answers are here in just a second. So keep an eye on the chat for those of you watching live. All right, let's keep going. Um, can you talk about ADF, 36, uh, alternate day fasting, 36 hour fasting every other day? It, again, we talked about this in my support group this morning. This morning, um, the uh, there was a lady who has been coming, oh, she was super sweet, uh, but she is moving back to New York. And so it was her last time here and she wanted some long-term advice about, okay, I've got to, the, I, I've been practicing fasting. I've been using the fasting muscle. And I'm like, this is something you learn. Again, those number nine wires for learning how to change a behavior and improve outcomes. They're not glib. They really do have a process of improving 
uh, a skill set that you practice. So I walk people through those steps in Keto Continuum. I do not want you fasting if it's your first week of keto. I do not want you fasting if you've been keto for less than 12 weeks. I would push you to not do that. But there is a process called alternate day fasting where they eat a meal every 48 hours um, or every 36 hours every other, every other day. I mean, uh, okay, so their eating window is not an hour, it's you know, four to six hours. But what I look at for, um, um, what I look at for people who are struggling with um, alternate day fasting and what advice to tell them is, first of all, I, I warned her. I'm like, I have an hour long lecture about this exact topic with every slide about what is the difference between fasting from a ketogenic state and fasting from a normal standard American diet, typical fast. And when you look at the return of what you get for growth hormone, what you get for norepinephrine, what you get for autophagy, essentially, um, I never recommend that my patients do this longer than 72 hours. I recommend that they pulse once a week for eight weeks in a row. And that's where that eight weeks of 72 hour fasting comes from. It's like winding up a motor that you continue to pull on uh, because those three days of fasting, 72 hour fast is an impressive burst of those hormones. You do not get the burst of hormones if you are not keto adapted. Do not start with a 72 hour fast. There is a great way to measure how well is your body handling the fast? How well is your body uh, dealing with the removal of fluid? And how well are those electrolytes replaced in your system? I fast every week for 48 to 60 hours. Uh, I'd like to say the word 72, but I haven't done that in a while. <laughs> um, and my body doesn't get low on hormones. Uh, my body doesn't get uh, fatigued. I, I do some of my best work on Tuesdays when I'm fasted by 48 hours. That isn't because it's my first fast. It's because I've practiced this and my, I've really wrung out and replaced the minerals that need to be there. I've practiced stimulating my, my, my metabolism, my mitochondria, um, and the performance is something that's dependable in my, in my metabolism. And I tell you that because when say, can you talk about alternate day fasting and is it healthy? Um, I would much rather see people get to a 48 hour fast and then do the five days of keeping that eating window only you know, three or four hours, whatever is your baseline metabolism and you stay within that baseline metabolism. Oh shoot, I, I was gonna put that on. I didn't hook that up tonight. Anyway, um, when you look at baseline metabolism, I wanna know what's your eating window? How wide is it? And when you have an eating window that starts at noon and doesn't top, stop until six o'clock at night, you have a six hour eating window, I'm gonna push you uh, to take that eating window closer to sunrise before you fast. Like, yes, you can stop eating and not eat from noon to six on Tuesdays, okay? Yep, you could do that. But you are gonna get a way better return for your efforts. If you take that eating window and either you shrink it to four hours, and I would prefer that you take it off the evening end, meaning you still start at noon, but you stop eating at four. And then, once you're doing that, you're not, you don't just do it for two days, you did it for a month and you kept your eating window to four hours and you didn't eat in the evenings. Now add a fast to that. And now what you've done is you've really taken your metabolism, you honed in where you put those calories in, your satiety hormones are going to be bursting. It is incredible how much better they feel when they start saying, I don't want you to just hop over to fasting. And I know when you're young and healthy, that's fine. But the people that come to my clinic, they've been around the sun a few times and they've screwed up a few things like their metabolism. It is activating. You can do this again. You can make that metabolism work really well, but there's a sequence of order to it. And you know, cons the keto continuum is a gentleman's story, David's story that tells you he wanted to do this his harebrained way. And he screwed it up good and proper. And then he came back and said, okay, I'll try it your way. And now, and so that's not just his story. That happens again and again. <laughs> I did that. I was like, I can do this. I can do this. And I fell off the wagon enough times that I finally said, boy, I bet these rules apply to me too. And I try to show you that on this show. 
that when I look at 36-hour fasting, yes, I think it's a good idea for somebody whose endocrine system, whose fat-based hormones are churning fat and they are surging when they stress their metabolism. Because when they fast and they're not ready, first of all, they feel terrible. Uh, they, their endocrine system just kind of burps a little bit instead of peaks the hormones and then shuts down when they're done stressing that metabolism. If you look at those sections of keto continuum, that bottom section is called metabolism stressing or stressing the metabolism. And that is meant to give you a peak of hormones and then a flush. And that is what proper diets are supposed to really look like. Just for effort, I see Patrick's um, uh, response to that, um, those, that aura care as he says, yes, that is fine. Thanks, Patrick. All right, let's go back to some of these questions. Uh, I, and I see that my team put that in my, my work for me. Let's do a couple more. I know we're gonna go over a little bit of time, but uh, again, I felt really bad that I didn't get this. Thank you so much, Patrick. Uh, all right, Wild Tiger again says, can one detox and normalize from opiates and benzodiazepines after 35 years of responsible use or is the damage too much? I would tell you absolutely. I would tell, my first recommendation for you is to do it on a bed of ketones. That after years of being the doctor who can really reignite what a brain can repair from, Man, I just got spanked by how much faster you can do it in a state of ketosis. That I don't recommend anybody come off of one of the um, mood altering drugs from THC to opiates to benzos um, without having ketones in their brain. And I don't care if you drink them. The data on supplemental ketones for addiction, it is powerful. It changes the landscape of how quickly we can heal a brain. Um, you know, Wild Tiger, if you haven't looked at where Pella, Iowa is, I would, and you haven't taken the brains course, um, I mean, I really market that brains course for the leaders of a community, and I want you to teach it to other people. We're working on our website to do this in a way that's much more efficient. Right now, it, it, it's kind of messy on how we share that video, um, but we are looking for a process that is much easier to share. Um, if you have a, uh, if you haven't taken the course, um, Show up in Pella, Iowa and watch what I teach about brains and opiates and we have a really good time during that workshop. It truly is my favorite thing. I, I said after the first time I perfected it, which was not the first time I gave it, but when I finally perfected that um, performance, that I could, I could successfully die because that was a, that was a very life-changing activity for me. Um, all right, my husband text, just texted me and says our date is to go to the sauna tonight, so I'm gonna finish this up and go on my date. <laughs> um, I'm fasting and going on into the sauna. Yes, that's what I'm doing. Okay, can being on keto affect muscles and joints? Pain, I hurt so much, it's unreal. Terry, you shouldn't hurt on the ketogenic diet. It makes me think you are very low on magnesium and sleep probably. Um, so the first thing I would do if you're stuck in a spiral death trap like that where you're in pain, because I think you had a comment last week too, uh, I would push you to drink ketones for a week. Oh, here's tonight's question. Um, Chia seeds and inflammation. Um, okay, so I'm gonna punt on this one and say there is a really good chapter on chia seeds in the Keto Continuum. Uh, I'm pretty sure I copied and pasted that into the, the workbook and I gave you a protocol to follow on it. It is, oh, I, got, I went too high there, sorry. Uh, and I also put that in um, the online course Consistently Keto. Chia seeds are great, they do not change the sugar. Um, they are not great and forever, but they are an important part of people whose bowel has been stimulated to move stools by stretching it. And that is not a help, that's a quick fix. That's not the way your bowel is supposed to work. It's supposed to have peristalsis delivered by improving um, uh, the, the quality of your stools. <laughs> I just recorded the uh, fiber video that's coming out in the next few weeks. Uh, so I'm laughing at the way I ended that video. <laughs> All right, if you do virtual tickets, can we watch? Oh yeah, you can do the, yeah, so thank you for asking that, Karen. This is the virtual tickets for the Metabolic Summit. Yes, you can watch those videos later. Like that's the other part of this that I'm so excited about. In the past, I've made my husband go sit in one hallway for the Metabolic Summit, and I told him, you need to take notes here <laughs> and then tell me what you learn. I'm going to this hallway. <laughs> he does love me. Um, so yes, uh, watch that later. Hey doc, um, 
we need to do a replaced craving for pain relief. 20 years on opiates, oh, it's, it, it is hard. Um, boy, I would actually have you reach out to Tammy. Uh, she leads a really good support group and we've done several videos on Tammy because her neuropathy, which was really her nerves were fried from uh, chemo and radiation that, uh, that saved her life. She really did have a life saving um, uh, journey that changed um, because she was able to live through a cancer that most people don't live through. But the price she paid was nerves that didn't have any fat around them anymore. And she was on a lot of opiates and she took the time um, to improve her nerve health by uh, staying not just a little bit keto. She followed everything I said. She took that workbook, she took the online course, she now teaches other people with it. And she's beautiful. She's this beautiful giving woman who really is meant to change her community for the better. And those are the people that I wanna attract, I wanna activate into and empower them because I do think there is no prescription that I can buy. There is no treatment plan uh, that I can offer that replaces and and um, changes the messed up health protocols that we have in today's world. Um, so I, I really do uh, encourage you to reach out to Tammy, um, become, become part of her class because she does get a lot of people that reach out to her. And when you become part of her class, she gets to pay the bills a little, I think. So help her out. All right, so Tammy, or there's, oh, two more questions. One of them is from Tammy. Um, and the, I'll do these last two and then we'll call it good. Thank you, thank you. Hold on, I gotta go back to that little button. Okay, so Tammy says, how do ketones affect our gut health and microbiome? So again, one of the key components to a ketone, especially a ketogenic salt when you swallow ketones, is that they are very readily absorbed. Um, the molecule is, um, it's connected to a salt, that salt dissociates with the enzymes in your gut, the ketone goes in, the micro, micronutrients of sodium, potassium, chloride, or um, calcium go through that um, enterocyte absorption. And the ketone production is an the ketone is an antioxidant, so it is binding up these, you know, unaccounted for electrons that happen in bodies that age, that bodies that are unhealthy, um, and ketones in general decrease the inflammation of whatever chemistry environment they're in. You can say that with without hesitation because of their antioxidant properties, their ability to bind rogue electrons to take the hydrogen that's not supposed to be out there buzzing around that's causing problems and changes it and one of the best measurements of a gut health is the density of the slime layer the slime layer shouldn't be aqueous it, it should not be water like it should be dense it should be squishy it should be viscous and um, slime layers uh, don't like fiber they don't like high sugar uh, but they do like ketones because of that anti-inflammatory effect. So the gentleman who said, could I just get by with MCT oil? Yes, that will help it. But it does, you gotta have a healthy gut to get that absorbed. And I have met folks that just couldn't absorb the MCT as well. Uh, six week, four to six weeks on just consuming ketones and now they're on to the MCT. Now they can graduate to those other properties. And they felt great, which is a benefit. Um, last question, what is the best time? Oh, this is a really good question, Harvey. I meant to say this. Uh, uric acid strips, when should we use them? Okay, so again, I'm gonna go back over here um, and push on this little fella here. Turn that guy off, turn on this. Okay, this is the uric acid thing and I'll end with this. So uric acid strips are very helpful. Uh, again, I should check one now. No, okay, so I should not check one now. I'm fasting. So when you look at things that make the uric acid go up, it is the movement of uric acid from a storage place to your kidneys, which is where it goes out of your body. Uh, and if you're measuring the transit movement of uric acid uh, in a peak time where you're kind of moving a lot of it, it's not really a good check of uric acid. It's gonna look higher than it really is. We want you to check uric acid um, at a time where life is stable. Let's go back to the uh, let's take me for example. So I fast starting on Sundays. I like to start my fast in the early afternoon on Sundays. This week was Easter and we I didn't start fasting until evening, like six o'clock or something. So the fasting hour 
got um, uh, is going to get done tonight, probably after we go to the sauna. We might go out for a bite to eat or something. I don't know. Maybe I won't break my fast till tomorrow. Uh, but on that'll be Wednesday. It would not be a good idea for me to check my uric acid now. The longer I fast, the more, think of it as the more autophagy that's happening, the more debris that's being pulled out of a place that it can empty. Um, like uric acid that I accidentally put between, I don't know, the epithelial cells in my toe or the joint cells in my big toe or uh, uric acid can, it, it's crystals that end up in a place that they shouldn't. So they're all throughout your body. They're known for being in a joint because the temperature is a little lower inside those joints, which once the crystals form, they tend to stay there then. But getting them out as possible, especially as you lower the debris in your system, you lower the insulin, you lower the glucose. So you're really churning uric acid as you fast. Um, again, you want to fast during a time of keto adaption. Do not start fasting in the first weeks of being keto. You really want to be consistently keto in stage four or five of that, of that keto continuum before you fast. Um, but that when you do fast, don't waste your high dollar strips because they're about three bucks a strip or maybe more, maybe 10 bucks a strip. Um, the uric acid strip when you're fasting, it's just going to look high. I mean, you can do it for experimental reasons and go, go, go do your... Go spend your money there. But don't put the uric acid, don't check it until, like personally, I wouldn't check mine even on Wednesday because if I fast, let's say I fast till tomorrow morning, I have breakfast. Um, I'm still going to be having this wave of autophagy. Autophagy doesn't stop the moment you eat. Uh, it'll settle back down into normal by Thursday or Friday. So I should check my uric acid on Thursdays or Friday because that's a normal time of me eating. Um, and I would probably check it around noon because maybe I would, I, I mean, I, I sometimes, I, I try to eat before five o'clock, um, but during the time whenever I eat would be a good time. Check your uric acid about an hour after you eat. You just don't want to check it at a time when you're in a big churn of autophagy uh, because you're just going to see a high number. The other thing about uric acid stri test strips, the point of care ones, meaning in person, the reason 10 is not a big deal to have on hand is if you get a high one, you can have an erroneously high uric acid, but it's really hard to have an erroneously low one. So if you do three uric acids and one comes back at eight, and then the next one comes back at six, and the next one comes back at 5.8, 5.8 is right. I mean, it doesn't error inappropriately low. Um, and the reason for that is that you are moving uh, uric acid from one point to the next in your, in your point of care. Um, so there is um, a uh, there is a dopamine lecture that I have, and if you are watching this uh, uh, video. Uh,